the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And when they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves, now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. And then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. And while he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountainside to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. You may be seated. Father God, cause your word as we've sung, cause your word to come alive in us. Have its way, your way, in us today. In Jesus' name. So this message and this passage is one of those messages and passages that I could have used a couple more weeks to prepare for. And it is one of those passages that, you know, you really need like four or five messages. So I'm quite aware that um, I'm going to not, this is going to be a broad strokes kind of message. And there's going to be a lot that you might be thinking, well, he he missed that part. (laughs) I know. (laughs) But, you know, Jesus says in this passage, uh, we read in this passage that, Jesus taught until late in the day. So if you want to go there, we can. Just remember that when you look at your watch later on today. Uh, (laughs) All right? But I won't do that to you. But we will, you know, I want to encourage you to study this on your own. Dive into the Word. Whenever, and that's an encouragement for every Sunday, really. Whenever... The pastor gets up and gives you the word. It's not done yet. It's time for you to go home and dig deeper and be like a Brian and receive with eagerness and then go and see that the scriptures, what the scriptures say is true. All right. Um, So today we're looking at the only miracle other than the resurrection that is mentioned in all four gospels. And it may seem at first glance to be a simple miracle of food, but it was important enough to the Holy Spirit that he inspired it to be included in every gospel. So as we come upon this scene in the gospel of Mark, Jesus had just received his his disciples back from their missionary journey. And we see 
that Mark divides the departure of the disciples and the return of the disciples with the tragic account of the execution of John the Baptist. And we see Mark specifically mentioned in this passage that we just read that Jesus is wanting time alone with his disciples. And after the miracle, Jesus goes and finds time alone to pray. And we don't see specifically the moment where Jesus hears of John the Baptist's death, but you can, you can assume, we can assume that he found out. He heard of his friend's death. You know, we know that Jesus knew that Lazarus died before the news got anywhere. The Holy Spirit revealed it to Jesus. And so even if no one came and told Jesus that John the Baptist died, he knew. And we see his great concern, his desire for alone time. Alone time with his disciples, and then alone time with his father. We see <clears throat> that Jesus desires that intimacy, that moment, away from the crowds. But the crowds are following his disciples. Because God has been moving mightily. God has been doing mighty things through the ministry of the disciples. And the word has gotten out. And so with the, the, the returning disciples come the crowds. Wanting to see this Jesus. And the people are coming in the thousands. And so the crowds follow the boat with the disciples and Jesus. The crowds saw where the boat was heading, and they get there ahead of them. Waiting. And so now the Greek word translated in the ESV as desolate, says it's a desolate place, is probably better understood. In English, we, we hear desolate and we think barren. Rocks. But we see later on that Jesus tells them to sit down on the green grass. And so this isn't a, an ugly atmosphere. This isn't just rocks and, you know, bush, a desert brush, you know. This is, desolate is better understood as solitary. All right? So it's a place away from the towns. It's secluded. So that's a better word for us to put in our minds. It's a secluded place, all right? And so Jesus wanted to go to this secluded place to get away from the crowds. That wasn't going to happen today. They were already there. And so even though he desires this time alone, even though he desires time with his disciples, and we see later on him pursuing time with his father. We all can feel that way, right? I just need time away. Even though this is on Jesus' heart, when he sees the crowd, I want you to notice his reaction to them. He doesn't become annoyed or angry or disheartened or disappointed. Some of us can get that way with our plans, right? Don't interrupt my plans. I got everything worked out exactly the way it should be. But that's not how Jesus reacts. He sees the crowd and he has compassion on them. For they are like sheep without a shepherd. And we see this phrase, sheep without a shepherd, used to describe Israel. We see it in 1 Kings chapter 22, we see it in Ezekiel, chapter 43, we see it in Zechariah, chapter 10. The people of Israel have no guide. They have no direction. But think about this a bit more. Why? Why do they have no shepherd? Why are they like sheep without a shepherd? It is not because God desired that state for them. He has repeatedly offered himself to these people. And yet they have chosen time and time again to be shepherdless. And so because of their rejection of God repeatedly, or their replacing of God, they have no shepherd to tell them where safe pasture is. 
No shepherd to lead them towards life and steer them away from death. Each one is following, following their own will and their own desires or the will or desires of some other sheep. That's what sheep do. You remove the shepherd and they just follow where their nose takes them. Or they see another sheep following where their nose takes them and says, hey, that guy knows. I'm following him. Just because a sheep looks like he's in the know doesn't mean he knows. Sheep have the perspective of sheep. They follow their hunger. They follow their nose. They follow their heart. Does that sound familiar? They follow their heart. They follow their impulses or the impulses of other sheep. And if left on their own, they will follow their feelings right off a cliff. And so our Lord sees the people and has compassion on them. He sees their desperate need, their desperate need for him. And what does he do? And he began to teach them many things. Do you see how he responds immediately to their need? Not first with food. Not first with shelter. Not first with healings or exorcisms. His compassion for them moves him to respond first with teaching. You know, it has become popular in Christian circles to undersell or de-emphasize the importance of biblical teaching and preaching. But this de-emphasis on teaching is not the example of Christ. Christ saw the need of the crowd, saw their lack of a shepherd, and he met that need with his word. We cannot overemphasize the importance of biblical teaching. Christ taught, and Christ taught his disciples to teach. He commissioned them, teach them to obey all I have commanded you. Sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd is how the Lord saw him, saw them. When I read that description, I'm reminded of Proverbs 29.18. And now Proverbs 29.18 is often misused. And you've often heard it quoted as, without a vision, the people perish. And the way that's used most often is in motivational books for pastors. Motivational speakers say that to pastors. Without a vision, the people perish. And so what they're saying, what they're saying and the way I've heard it used over and over again is, unless you have an awesome, exciting, amazing five-year plan, your people will become discouraged and will fall away. That is not actually what Proverbs 19.18 really teaches according to the context. With respect to those who teach it that way. Contextually, that verse most likely does not refer to having a grandiose five-year plan. I want to tell you that that's something that so many churches ask when you're going through the uh, campaigning process. It's been quite some time since I've done that. I've been here for 15 years. But I remember campaigning, and I remember I, I, I did it for three other churches before coming here, and, and they all have the same question. Well, where do, you sell, where do you see God bringing your ministry in five years? And they never liked my answer, and my answer was always, I don't know. I don't have a plan. I am a follower of the one who does. And so I'm not going to say, hey, God, bless my plans. I'm going to say, yes, I will do what you call me to do, whatever it is, even if it doesn't make sense to my plan. That's not in my notes. Sorry, I go off and I get in trouble. But anyway, what, what Proverbs 19.18 actually teaches is what we see in this crowd. So let's read that verse, Proverbs 19.18. And we're going to read 17. Discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give you delight for your heart. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Now the ESV translators have put that word prophetic in there because that's really what, that, what, the, what the Hebrew is relating. 
Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. They become like sheep without a shepherd. The people cast off restraint. And then the verse goes on, but blessed is he who keeps the law. So verse 18 again, where there is no prophetic vision. In other words, no word from the Lord. This is, this is not some verse for leadership strategy conferences. Leaders, what your people need, what the church needs, is not a five-year plan. That's the, the, the gimmick we're sold. Give them a vision. That's not what this probably means. Instead, what the people need is prophetic vision. For their shepherds to be in the word and of the word and be able to say, thus saith the Lord. We see elsewhere the people astonished by Jesus because he taught as one with authority. The people had many teachers, but none like this. None who spoke for God. None with prophetic vision. Jesus taught with the knowledge of God and his will. And he taught the knowledge of God and the will of God because he had a deep, intimate relationship with his father. Without a prophetic vision, the people cast off. Restraint. They become like sheep without a shepherd. And so immediately we see the good shepherd beginning to provide for the sheep what they truly need. And what they need is him. And he teaches them for some time. Teaches them until his disciples grow weary. Verse 35 says, And when it grew late, his disciples came and said, This is a desolate Place and the hour is now late, send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, I love this, you give them something to eat. Beloved, the commands of the Lord are never to tease. They're never sarcasm. The disciples had just come back from a successful ministry journey, where they had seen miracles done by them in the name of Jesus. And yet this command, they considered far beyond them. Let me ask you, I've asked this before, but let me ask you again. Will God ever command you to do something that seems impossible for you to do? Absolutely he will. There's plenty of, uh, that comes my way in my life that I am not able to handle. There's plenty of direction that comes from the Lord that, I am, that he calls me to do that I am not sufficient to do in my own strength. But nothing is impossible with God. God will absolutely call you to do something that is impossible for you to do in your own strength. But when you move in obedience to obey, even when it doesn't make sense, he will accomplish the impossible in you and through you. You give them something to eat. The Lord's command is immediately met with astonishment. What? How? Sometimes, What God asks us to do has the initial effect of showing us just how inadequate we truly are. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give give it to them to eat? Some commentators assumed that this meant that the disciples were actually carrying around a year's wage between them. Because that's what that is. 200 denarii is a year's wage. And so they were carrying around all this money. But considering the minimal belongings that they took on the journey that they just returned from, I find that idea very unlikely. What we can learn from verse 37 is the amount of food that would have been needed to feed this crowd. In John chapter 6, we see Philip estimated that it would take a year's wage even to give someone, everyone a bite, let alone be filled. 
Mark tells us that there were 5,000 men. Matthew 14 mentions that there were women and children there as well. And so it's been estimated that there were probably somewhere between 15,000 to 25,000 people altogether. 25,000, just to give you some understanding since we're in Detroit, 25,000 is about 5,000 more than the maximum capacity of Little Caesars, Little Caesars Arena. That's a lot of mouths to feed to satisfaction. And then we see in verse 38, Jesus asked the disciples to look and see what they have. We're talking about 25,000 people. What do, you, what do you mean look and see what we have? We see in the Gospels of John that the food the disciples found wasn't even theirs. It was from a boy, so they took some other kid's lunch. <laughs> and he, was, he probably overheard them talking and said, oh, I have some food with the heart of a child, I have some food, and offered up his, his meager food. And we read that there's five loaves and two fish. Just so you understand even more, these aren't French loaves, right? And when we read loaves, that word in the Greek is actually biscuit. All right? So these are like Popeye's biscuits, but hard and flat. All right? This was... One little kid's lunch. And these are not salmon. They're little fish, probably pickled or smoked little fish. It's enough to feed one small child. Not enough to feed two, let alone 25,000. But God is the God who makes something out of nothing. He's the God who can make much out of very little. He is the God who confounds the wisdom of men. He is the God who purposefully uses the little things, the small things, the weak things, to confound those who consider themselves great. If you think you got it all together, most likely you're not in a place for God to use you yet. If you look at, see, I don't got hardly anything. You're right where you need to be. In 2 Kings 4.42 Elisha is used by God to perform a very similar, similar miracle as 20 small, single-serving loaves and some grain are multiplied to feed 100. And also in 2 Kings chapter 4, we see God perform the miracle of the oil from one jar filling many large vessels that were around 20 to 30 gallons each. So God is not bound by natural law. And so Jesus asks his disciples, what do you have? Beloved, no matter how small our means, no matter how weak or tiny or insignificant we think we are, God desires to use us. I want to just speak to this really quickly. A lot of us feel like, I've done my part. I'm tired. I'm worn out. Good! Because when it's when we reach the end of ourselves that God really wants to start moving. We retire when we die, and we move up to promotion. We're not done serving the Lord as long as we're breathing. And if you, if you feel like you have been, and this is not a plug for children's ministry, though it might apply. <laughs> if you feel like you have been and you're done, I want to tell you, you're missing out. Because God wants to take you no matter how small your offering is, he wants to use you to do the miraculous. God desires that we obediently surrender all that we are to him. and He asks that we obey what he asks us to do, regardless of whether it makes sense to us or not. What Jesus asked his disciples to do made no sense. Now, there was and is an ancient Jewish tradition that Messiah, who, whoever he was, would be a redeemer like Moses. And this thought has been carried on through, Jewish, through the Jewish people for thousands of years, both before and after Christ. And that thought was simply phrased this way by Rabbi Berechiah, who said, and he was quoting another rabbi, as the first redeemer was, so the latter redeemer shall be. 
As the former redeemer caused manna to descend, so the latter redeemer caused manna to descend. Written by people who missed it. Who missed what Jesus does in this account. What Jesus accomplishes here. In Acts 3, we see Peter quoting Moses from Deuteronomy 18.15. Moses said, said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. This Jesus is the one they were looking for. He is the one we are looking for. But we, like they 2,000 years ago, can miss it if we're not careful. Can miss him. If we, like they, try to place our own definitions and expectations upon him. See, that's why they miss what's going on here. Because they had their own expectations of what Messiah would be. Now, before we go further, I feel we need to deal with some thoughts of skepticism about this miracle. No other miracle has come under the ridiculous scrutiny that this one has. Skeptics have tried to explain this miracle away by arguing that, well, many people in the crowd had food. But they either kept it secret or didn't think to eat it until suddenly this child gave up his food and then the crowd was moved to share and suddenly there was more food coming out of people's robes than anyone could eat. It was a miracle of compassion. This is not some miracle of compassion done by the crowd. These people were not carrying food with them. There is no mention by the disciples of seeing some people snacking secretly and others going hungry. And some skeptics go so far as to say Jesus did this miracle in in front of a hidden stash that he had earlier filled with food. No, this is not trickery. Jesus did not have a couple ancient semi-sized trucked wagons behind him, hidden by some desert brush. He didn't use ancient smoke and mirrors to deceive people. And I, you know, I honestly don't understand why this miracle receives as much backlash as it does. Even Christian skeptics are somehow, somehow have problem with this, this idea of Jesus creating fish and bread. And yet some of these same skeptics believe in the God who created the universe. It makes no sense to me. This is Christ supernaturally multiplying food. The creator of the laws of the universe spoke the universe into existence. The miracle is meant to show exactly who he is. That's the point. This is the one who made all things out of nothing or rather spoke all creation into existence out of his mind. And so we see from John's account in John 6 that the people who witnessed this miracle knew it was a mighty miracle, and it, and it impacted them greatly. They wanted to force Christ to be their political king. But when Christ applied the point of the feeding, when he explained that he was the bread of life, that they needed to take into themselves, most turned their backs on him. This miracle is not about a good meal. This miracle is about Jesus being our satisfier. Jesus himself, not just what he gives. Beloved, I want to tell you the point of every miracle is not simply to bring us into shock and awe. Wow, what a trick. That's not the point of miracles. The point of miracles is not to give the crowd goosebumps. The point of miracles, regardless of the form they take, is to glorify God. And God's purpose for his glorification is to draw people unto himself. God does not require glory because he is somehow insecure and needs his ego boosted. God must be glorified so that those who are seduced by self and by sin might come face to face with their lost state and turn from darkness to the one who is light. And that's what this miracle is about. It's not meant to highlight food. 
It's meant to highlight the creator of all food. It's not about bread, for man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Even the leftover food has meaning. How many baskets are left over? Twelve. How many disciples are there? Do you realize these baskets most likely are, according to this word and according to Strong's Greek concordance, these baskets are not these huge baskets like this that we see in the movie Jesus of Nazareth. I love that movie. But that's, that's not really what that Greek word is pointing to. What, what, what it's talking about is a small little basket that you would hang around your, uh, around your midsection and would hang at your, at your side that would carry a one person's meal, one person's lunch. So after they serve everybody and everybody's satisfied, how much is left over? Enough for them. Just enough for them. There's no coincidence with God. But we and the people and the disciples are not meant simply to say, wow, how wonderful, that's cool. The miracle was not the point. Miracles never are. Miracles are meant to point to the miracle worker. And later on, we see that people started following Jesus and they wanted to force him to do what they wanted him to do. Think about it. Can you blame him? Here's this king who gives us amazing food. Here's this guy who heals our sick, who casts out demons. Let's make him king. Let's force him to become king, and then, then he can free us from our oppressors. He can get Rome out of here, and can, can get Herod and that line out of here. Finally, we have this, this Messiah who will be what we want him to be. It's easy for us to shake our heads and say, oh, those silly people. Beloved, that we, that's the same thing we do today. We want God to do for us, to be what we want him to be for us. And your TV and the radio is filled and YouTube is filled with preachers who will tell you, God wants you to live your best life now. But that's not who God is. The true God loves us and values us too much to only want for us what we want for us. The Santa Claus God of so many preachers is small and false. The lie of the health and wealth gospel, the lie of easy believism, that God will be whoever you want him to be, the lie of making Jesus into what you want him to be, that lie robs us of the richness of who God actually is. And so, beloved, I find myself in these days concerned for for the church. I find myself concerned for the church often. In so many ways, we have replaced the God of the Bible with a God that we find more palatable, more controllable, more easy. But as I read the account of Israel, I see a God who will not tolerate his people bowing down to any man-made idol. Idol worship brings devastation. And we see God promising the surviving exiles in Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and you will find me when... You seek me with all your heart. God promised them to the exiles. God doesn't tell them everything's going to be great. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. God promised them not the betterment of their worldly circumstance, not health and wealth or prosperity or power or position or security, which is what so many in the church are chasing today. We want security. I want to feel safe. I want to know I have a future on this world. I want health. I want wealth. I want prosperity. Seek first the kingdom of God. So God's glorious promise to the exiles was that In the midst of their circumstance, when they sought God above all things, then they would find God. But in Mark 6 and John 6, that is not what we see from this crowd. 
crowd is not alone in misunderstanding this miracle, in their misunderstanding of Christ. In verse 51, we read that he got into the boat with them after walking on the water, and they were utterly astounded. They had already seen him calm the storms with a word. They'd seen him feed 5,000 men and, and all the women and children that were there as well. They'd seen him do miracle after miracle after miracle. Verse 52 says, For they did not understand about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. By this time, they should have figured out who this Jesus was. But Mark says they were utterly astounded. They were astounded to see him walking on water and the wind ceasing because they did not understand the loaves. And what is the message of the loaves? The same one who sent manna from heaven is feeding you right now. This is God. He does not simply provide the bread from heaven. He is the bread from heaven. He does not simply desire that we feed on the bread that he gives us, that he gave them, but that we partake in him, that he becomes our nourishment. Listen to the prophecy of, from Isaiah chapter 40. Behold, the Lord comes with, him with might, and his arms rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd, gather the lambs in his arms. He will gather them in his bosom and gently lead those that are, that are with young. He is the shepherd they need. He is the shepherd we all need. For we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on the good shepherd the sin of us all. And again, I find myself quoting Colossians 1. It seems like I'm reading this verse every, every time I preach. He is the image of the invisible God. This is Jesus. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of, and in the Greek, this is better understood as over, the firstborn over all creation. The firstborn is the ancient expression of his office as Lord over the Father's estate. Verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There is a purpose and truth behind every miracle. Jesus is that purpose. Jesus is that truth. This is not simply some truth that the crowd and disciples missed, and we know. We have to understand that. This is not simply a truth that we are to collect and store away. Oh, now I know that every miracle is about the miracle worker. Take that, put it in my pocket, and do nothing with it. This is not simply a truth that intellectually knowing somehow makes us in better standing before God than those who do not know this truth. Beloved, we do not worship facts and figures. We worship the one who is truth. We are to be in a relationship with the one who is truth. It's not enough to know truth. You must know the one who is truth. And we come to the scriptures for the same purpose Jesus taught and the same purpose he performed miracles so that we might come into relationship with the God who has given his only son to restore us to the relationship that we were created for. We come to him not to seek the bread that passes away. We come to feed on him. He is our portion. And every one of us must ask, who are we now? And who does God desire us to be? Are we like the crowd? Do we see Jesus as a meal ticket, as the one who has done for us and can do for us again? Is our faith like the faith of this crowd, like the faith of so many today? Do we see Christianity and the God of Christianity just as, as life enhancement? Whenever we come to the word, every one of us is called to hear from the Spirit and to ask ourselves difficult questions. Questions like, why am I here? We should be asking that today, now, right now, right where you're at, in your seat, right now. If I didn't make that clear, now. You should be asking the question, why am I here? In this pew, why am I here? 
Why do I come to church? Why do I not? For those of you listening at home and those of you who are not listening at home, why do I not come to church? What is my faith about? Is my life my life? Or does my life reflect the fact that I have been bought by the blood of Jesus? That I am no longer my own? That I am not satisfied with worshiping a God of my own design? That instead, I want to be redesigned by God? Is that what you want? Is that really what you want? These are important questions we need to ask God to give us the courage to honestly ask ourselves. So maybe today you're here, you're watching on YouTube, and you realize that you have yet to enter into a relationship with the one who is the point of all life, the point of all creation. You know, maybe you've gone to church your whole life. That doesn't mean you're in relationship with the one that all this is about. We get that wrong very often in church. We think that if we know it all, if we pack our minds with information that we're set. Beloved, even the demons believe and shudder. And I want to tell you that every atheist, almost every atheist I speak to has tons of Bible knowledge. It's not enough to pack away facts. It's not enough. It's not enough. We need to know that biblical education is absolutely necessary. Jesus Look at Jesus, how he began to feed the crowd, to to minister to the crowd with biblical instruction about himself. That is absolutely necessary, but it's not enough. You need to know God, not just enjoy the food he gives. You need to enjoy the giver of the food. You need to know him. And so if you're watching and you realize I don't. I have yet to know God through Christ. Or perhaps you have walked away from that relationship. Know this, that God even now is desiring to save you, to forgive you, to wash you clean and make you a brand new creation, to move you from the position of one who does not know God, does not know life, to one who has been brought into life, to make you his child, adopted by buying you with the precious cost of the blood of Christ. God is holding himself out to you. Christian, God is holding himself out to you. Non-Christian, God is offering himself to you. What he is offering you is nothing less than God himself. So I want to plead with you. As Paul says, we urge you, in Christ's sake, be reconciled to God. I want to urge you, don't choose less. Don't choose the God of your own design. Don't choose to follow after, after your own ideas because they make you feel good or they fit in with your own, your own convictions. That's not God. Don't just receive the bread. Receive the bread giver. Receive the miracle worker. Amen.